day and so forth. Please. Okay, I think we'll get started now. Uh, I'm uh, Bruce McDonald, uh, the United States Institute of Peace, and I'm going to be uh, moderating <coughs> this session on disarmament. I want to thank you all for uh, being here. And we have this nice big stage in this big room. Uh, I'm told that we may have a little uh, inspired by last night. If someone wants to do an interpretive dance addressing the subject of disarmament, that would be fine. Um, uh, but not in the question period, of course. Uh, we are very fortunate today to have a, a very distinguished panel to help us see through some of the issues uh, on, um, uh, on disarmament and a lot of the issues that are going to be very uh, vexing to attempt to, uh, to resolve uh, if we are ever going to even think about achieving greater reductions and ultimately going down uh, to zero. Uh, to my immediate left is Corey Hinderstein, who is Vice President at the Nuclear Threat Initiative Organization in Washington, and uh, she leads the Nuclear Threat Initiative's efforts to, related to building norms, regimes, and frameworks for global nuclear nonproliferation and security. And then to her left is uh, Ambassador Masood Khan, who is Pakistan's ambassador to China, so he should be able to bring to us some very interesting perspectives. He has been ambassador to China since uh, 2008, so for the last three years. And then going uh, down further down the list, we have uh, uh, Andrew Pierre, a colleague and friend of quite a number of years, at the United States Institute of Peace. He's the Jennings Randolph Fellow at USIP, and he's writing a fascinating book. I've had more than a few discussions with him about it, on national decisions to forego nuclear weapons. When we think about the problems of proliferation in the countries that may acquire nuclear weapons, we need to keep in mind, of course, that there are quite a number of nations that took on that decision and decided not to acquire them. Uh, and then finally, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Dr. John Park, also of the United States Institute of Peace. He's uh, been a wonderful colleague uh, and friend uh, to work with. He focuses on Northeast Asian security at the Peace Institute, economic and energy issues, and U.S. foreign policy uh, toward the region. So um, the way we'll just structure it is I'm just going to tee up uh, this session, make a few remarks, and then we'll turn to uh, each one of our panelists in turn to share their wisdom with us, and then we'll open it up to the floor uh, to you all. Uh, just a couple of points that I wanted to make in setting the stage here. Uh, one is that in the considering disarmament and ultimately the question, you know, uh, an issue that's been raised and discussed with more intensity than ever is the idea of going to zero nuclear weapons or global zero, as it's often called. And uh, I wanted to make just the, uh, the general point that uh, this is – some people think that this is, uh, should be a straightforward <coughs> exercise. Uh, I teach a course uh, on uh, nuclear weapons and uh, arms control and nonproliferation. At the end of uh, the, one of the, the courses I gave, this one student said to me, you know, when I came into this course, I thought that going to zero would be easy and we ought to be able to do it. And he said – boy, you know, you've kind of discouraged me. This is really going to be a tough problem. And I thought, well, I felt like I'd accomplished something, not that I'm a foe of nuclear zero. I'm actually, as a goal, I think it's, a, it's, it's excellent and uh, one that we need to strive toward. But it's going to be a very long and protracted uh, uh, process. And that in making those uh, reductions as we go further down and other limitations, because uh, at the end of the day there's more to – reducing nuclear threats than, than just worrying about numbers of uh, nuclear warheads, but that it's, uh, it's going to be uh, quite a challenge. And we, it's important to bear in mind where the, uh, the desire for nuclear weapons on the part of some countries comes from. It comes underneath all the rhetoric. It comes from insecurity and fear. And that, uh, to me, the idea of reducing nuclear weapons it's, um, I think of it as a little bit like there's a, an act in the circus where a woman rides two horses at the same time, you know, stands one foot on each saddle, and neither horse can get very far ahead or behind of the other or she falls off. And in the same way, I think of the uh, nuclear reductions and political conditions or political stability 
as being each one of the, each one of those two horses, and you cannot get uh, either one uh, should not get too far ahead or behind of the other, or it can be very dangerous. I think that, for example, one of the big reasons we've been, the United States and Russia have been able to achieve the reductions we have is that we're no longer enemies, and so the political requirement for it and the the fear that underlies it all has come down quite a bit, which has made it possible to have nuclear reductions. At some point, and we can still do, uh, still do more, but at some point, ultimately, countries need to feel secure, and uh, it's been necessary to rely on nuclear weapons for security, but if we're ever going to get anywhere close to zero, I believe it would have to come about because of significant transformations in the nature and the atmosphere of international uh, relations among countries of the world. Um, so uh, it's a difficult challenge, but we have to keep trying. In looking at the, the question of disarmament, I, I think of it, and nuclear zero, I think of it as at least four stages involved. First is what I would call the stage that we're facing right now, which is going to the next stage beyond the New START Treaty. And I call this the twilight of, the bi of bilateral nuclear arms control, and that this is the period when uh, it's unlikely that we would involve other countries, but that if, we, uh, if it's possible to achieve significant reductions in, in, the next, in this round, beyond that, it's going to have to go multilateral. Because at that point, you know, some people talk about 1,000 warheads, getting down to that 1,000 warheads as being one objective uh, in the next round of uh, what I call comprehensive nuclear arms talks because it, it will likely involve more than just strategic weapons. And in the round beyond that is, is then, therefore, I've just dubbed it the dawn of multilateral arms control uh, and fully comprehensive limits involving uh, the whole uh, range of nuclear weapons and not just uh, strategic weapons. Uh, when I think of how difficult it is <clears throat> just uh, achieving bilateral arms control. And do you think about the problems of multilateral arms control? It, it makes my head hurt uh, when you look at some of the challenges that are going to be involved. The next stage beyond that I dubbed the end of the end of the world levels of nuclear weapons. That's where you're getting down to a point where the numbers of nuclear weapons are uh, begin approaching a level where if nuclear war did break out, it would still be horrendous but it might not be, because there would be relatively uh, a much smaller number of, of levels, it doesn't mean that it would be the end of the world as we knew it because the uh, number of detonations would be relatively low. And then finally, of course, there's zero. And one thing I want to caution um, in thinking about zero nuclear weapons, when I talk to a lot of people who are enthusiastic about going to zero, they make it sound like, well, yes, it's going to be a hard struggle, but when we finally get to zero, won't it be great? And my sense is that unless there is an absolutely fundamental trans, uh, transformation of international relations, uh, staying, it's one thing to get to zero, but making sure that we stay at zero and in a way that where people feel secure, is, that's going to be a real challenge. So people should not think, in my view, that zero means uh, we finally reached a nuclear nirvana. Today, I think, in our discussion, uh, we may want to focus – primarily but not exclusively on that first stage, what we face in this next upcoming round where uh, the issues are very difficult, very challenging, although but we will talk about really uh, all, four, uh, all four phases of getting to zero. But in this next phase, we've got many challenging uh, uh, issues, missile defense, the tactical nuclear weapons, non-deployed weapons, uh, the problem of other nuclear powers and how that might influence agreements in this next round, verification, alliance dynamics, regional security, the, the, the challenges we face are endless. But, uh, but it doesn't mean we can't just plunge in and take it on because I think it's very important uh, to try to make progress uh, in this area. And here to help us um, uh, kick things off, I'll turn to Corey. Corey, please uh, uh, take it away. Thank you, Bruce. Um, first of all, I want to add my thanks to everyone who has spoken before me in thanking the organizers of the Asan Plenum, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be here for such an important event. 
Um, I'm going to, uh, in some ways, start at the micro level, and I think others are going to build up to the macro level, because I'm going to focus on the issue of disarmament verification and also explain a little bit as to why I think that the discussion of disarmament verification is um, helpful to us as we think about whether this is a credible or desirable path to move down. Um, as has been mentioned already, in particular yesterday at the opening plenary, uh, in 2007, George Schultz, William Perry, Henry Kissinger, and Sam Nunn came together in their really remarkable op-ed in the Wall Street Journal in which they made the case uh, for a joint enterprise of the international community to move toward a world free of nuclear weapons, and they linked that vision to um, concrete threat reduction steps. And these steps would reduce urgent nuclear dangers and build support for reducing the reliance on nuclear uh, weapons, ultimately leading to a world free of such weapons. They have since obviously authored three additional uh, op-eds, um, but that this first one really remains the guiding principle behind their work. But what you may be less familiar with than the op-eds is that at the same time in 2007, uh, shortly following the first op-ed, they launched the Nuclear Security Project at the Nuclear Threat Initiative. And through the NSP, NTI coordinates the work of the four statesmen, as well as undertaking a robust agenda of international activities and substantive um, analytic work that helps move us down the path towards their vision. The reason I mention this is because verification very early on in the first op-ed and in the discussions of the four was identified as an area that was where meaningful work really needed to be done for a number of reasons. One, as I'll get into, is the importance of a robust verification system for confidence, but also because verification is one of the longest lead time um, activities. And therefore, if we're not thinking now about how we might verify, we're going to get to the point where we want to make political decisions related to deep reductions or disarmament, and we don't have the technical basis to do that safely and securely, which I believe we definitely need to do. So the bottom line is that we're never going to move toward a world of far fewer nuclear weapons, much less zero, unless all states have confidence that we can verify disarmament commitments, non-proliferation obligations, and the peaceful use uh, of the nuclear material and civil nuclear activities that will be ongoing. We um, edited a volume, I edited a volume called Cultivating Confidence, in which we had nine expert authors talking about verification challenges, and I want to talk a little bit about some of the findings of that study. And perhaps the greatest reason for optimism, uh, for those of us who really support the end goal of a world without nuclear weapons, is that the international community actually already knows how to do a lot of what it needs to do in order to verify a world free of nuclear weapons. So often, this ability to verify is the hook upon which those who object with the end goal will hang those objections. And while there are still many technical and policy issues that have to be explored and an appropriate research agenda needs to be developed and cultivated, it's gratifying for me to note that we, the work over the last several decades within the scientific and technical community as a result of the bilateral arms control between the U.S. and Russia, uh, work of the International Atomic Energy Agency. This has direct bearing on our ability to envision and scope a credible verification system for a, uh, that goes not just um, at zero, but more importantly, helps us verify and build confidence on the path toward zero. So I want to focus on a few elements that demonstrate why the current debate about verification is really different than the verification debate we've had in the past. The first element is a recognition of different stakeholders. Um, te uh, traditionally, the technical problems of arms control verification has really been in the realm of the U.S. and Russia and the bilateral arms control process. And it's been based on decisions of acceptable risk within the jurisdiction of these nuclear weapon states. But in a world where states commit to a joint enterprise to work toward a world free of nuclear weapons, we have to realize that all states have a stake, and all states will have equities and responsibilities in the progress towards disarmament. So therefore, the role of non-nuclear weapon states in helping both uh, define the, their needs for uh, assurance and contributing their substantial technical expertise can't be underestimated. These non-nuclear weapon states can't be standing on the sidelines of the verification debate. 
A second element, and one that's controversial, I think, is the need to rethink the classified nature of information and the implementation of information security. With respect to nuclear technology and nuclear weapons, the standards by which information is deemed classified or sensitive sometimes rests on outdated assumptions about the unique value of the information and how it's shared. So it may be ultimately more practical to share certain previously protected information than it is to develop very complicated and expensive verification procedures that are designed to protect information that may no longer be sensitive. And this isn't to say that there's not a very real uh, and appropriate role for the protection of uh, key classified information. But we should carefully uh, review our underlying assumptions about what information would be critical to the success of a future verification regime. A third element is the issue of determining compliance and non-compliance with arms control obligations or commitments. Non-compliance is often in the eye of the beholder, as we like to say. For example, the IAEA has recently made judgments about the intent of violators in a way that <clears throat> may influence the reaction of the international community to the violation. The same safeguards violation, like a production of a small amount of nuclear material outside of safeguards, may invoke different consequences depending on a judgment of intent. Did the country deliberately attempt to develop clandestine capability in violation of its international agreements? Or was it the work of a small group of scientists in a program that may not have been transparent to its own national leadership? And I'm very well aware that making this statement here in South Korea may be particularly meaningful for those who know their recent history. Judgments of intent have been encouraged by some who feel that it allows for flexible and appropriate response, but it's criticized by others who say that the IAEA should make judgments and report or should detect and report violations without making qualitative judgments about their significance. This discussion highlights the fact that concepts of compliance and non-compliance are not always black and white. A fourth element is a systems-based approach to verification. We need to conceive of a verification system as different policy and technical approaches that has political acceptance, informed by knowledge of the defined risks, and that no individual verification measure is infallible. There is not a technical solution to all the problems related to it. But rather, by constructing a system of systems, then we maximize the opportunity for, or excuse me, maximize the the opportunity for the weakness of one measure to be compensated by another measure. In an effort to structure a system that leverages all the tools available, we'll look at technical approaches, legal and political commitments, the roles of public and insiders, incentives for compliance, deterrence of noncompliance, and an honest qualitative and quantitative acceptance of risk. And this is the only way to really determine if a system is um, acceptable and makes sense. The fifth and last element I want to highlight is that we've really been struck by the creativity of people thinking about verification and the value of considering, considering non-traditional approaches as part of a verification system. Some of the, these newer ideas really include um, societal verification, which is the role of those that have no legal obligation to find or report violations, the model of public-private partnerships that take advantage of information that may be um, held by a particular segment of society, such as industry, uh, but they're not, these are pieces of information that are not traditionally fed into verification systems. And these kinds of approaches require more rigorous analysis to determine their real value in what is traditionally a state-driven verification system. Finally, I think the biggest challenge to the overall verification uh, agenda for future arms reductions may be that posed by uncertainties regarding the quantities of existing stocks of fissile material and weapons. We have to develop strategies to reduce the re residual uncertainty regarding the completeness of initial declarations. All declared weapons-related inventories will become important as we move towards zero. And establishing confidence in countries' initial baseline declarations will likely be a key point in all states' decisions as to whether they're comfortable moving towards lower numbers, much less zero. This challenge is really compounded in the context of growing inventories of declared nuclear materials and civil applications and the spread of nuclear capabilities to previously non-nuclear regions of the world. So in conclusion, not surprisingly, 
verification agreements on the path toward a world free of nuclear weapons will be complex and challenging. In some cases, negotiation of future agreements between the U.S. and Russia and other states with nuclear weapons may be a driver to better refining verification regimes, as well as being the result of progress on verification. Similarly, during the NPT review process and other international discussions, verification of current ar arrangements may serve as the point of departure for cooperation and progress, but also as a roadblock if, uh, to further action if confidence in such measures is low. So in all cases, progress on both unilateral and cooperative efforts on verification could positively influence the ongoing nonproliferation and disarmament agenda. And I want to come back to my first comment, which is I'm actually quite confident about our ability to do this. The body of knowledge is robust. We lost about 10 years in really advancing the agenda, but there are a lot of very capable technical and policy leaders focusing on verification now. And the important thing is, if we want to empower the decision to go towards much lower numbers and zero in the future, these are the questions we need to be grappling with now and not waiting till that time when the political decision needs to be made and they suddenly look to the technical ex experts and ask, can we actually do this? Thank you. Hey, Corey, thank you very much for that good overview of the uh, verification challenges that uh, we, uh, we face ahead. Uh, let's turn the floor over to Ambassador Khan, who will, who will speak. Please. Well, uh, thank you, um, Mr. McDonald, for including me in this panel. It's a privilege to be part of this panel, and it's a pleasure to talk to all of you. Um, <clears throat> I have some written remarks. I'll be more interactive in a Q&A session, provided you have questions. It's uh, quite evident that there is no shortcut to global zero, yet it remains an important objective. Marilyn Albright and Igor Ivanov, in a recent article, have argued that nuclear arms control cannot forever remain a U.S.-Russia-only enterprise. These two countries have 90% of the world's nuclear weapons, and therefore they have to set the example by active leadership. Pakistan is committed to the goal of general and complete disarmament, as this is important, as this is important for international peace and security. The G21 group in the CD has also called for total nuclear disarmament and proposed the establishment of an ad hoc committee in a conference to start negotiations on a phased program for the complete elimination of nuclear weapons within a specified time frame, as well as conclusion of a nuclear weapons convention. It is true that President Obama took a bold step in his Prague speech put his political weight behind nuclear disarmament and gave a fresh impetus to the disarmament diplomacy focusing on global zero. Multilateral legal norms and instruments enjoy universal legality and acceptance. Decisions taken in non-institutionalized multilateral multinational forums will not have legitimacy. Disarmament which is advocated so ardently elsewhere, is not put on the agenda of the United Nations disarmament machinery for serious negotiations on either cuts or a convention. A proposed FMCT is conceived and projected as a non-proliferation measure, not an instrument for disarmament. The countries, within the, largest, the countries with the largest nuclear weapons stockpiles are most reluctant to start serious structured and substantive negotiations on disarmament. Even as some cuts are being made into the existing arsenals, new and more sophisticated devices are being developed and experimented. Development and actual battlefield use of mini-nukes have been theorized. The increasing prominence of nuclear weapons in security doctrines undercuts the logic of disarmament. The, ge the geographical scope for use of nuclear weapons has been expanded to nuclear alliances with the provisions to share nuclear weapons and command and control among alliance members. Finally, contrary to the resolutions 255 and 984 of the Security Council, 
doctrines have been expounded for the use of nuclear weapons against biological and chemical weapons and against terrorists. Even at drastically reduced levels, leading nuclear weapon states would like to retain their arsenals for quote-unquote foreseeable future against quote-unquote unforeseen threats in pursuit of quote-unquote new missions. The principles of transparency, verification, and irreversibility are not being observed. A swift movement to global zero will be possible if these misgivings, which I have listed, are removed now and political will uh, is already there to do that. In our region, in South Asia, a new security paradigm has emerged following a nuclear deal which has created a norm of exceptionalism. For us, nuclear capability is not for residual deterrence, but for existential deterrence. If the momentum for global zero picks up, there would be no sprint to parity, but countries would like to ensure that asymmetries do not accentuate or widen. Global Zero is being discussed today because relations between the United States and Russia are cooperative and are not confrontational. Under Secretary of State, Alan Tausher has talked about mutually assured stability instead of mutually assured destruction. In South Asia, one needs to resolve outstanding conflicts, bring about conventional balance, and practice nuclear restraint before one can take meaningful steps aimed at disarmament. Offensive military doctrines, massive inductions of advanced weapon systems, including ABMs, and buildup of nuclear arsenal and delivery systems are a recipe for armament and arms race, not disarmament. Pakistan's National Command Authority has rejected any attempt to undermine its strategic deterrence. We believe that regional balance and strategic stability in South Asia are indispensable for peace, sustainable development, and prosperity for the region and beyond. We in Pakistan will continue to maintain a minimum credible deterrent. At the same time, we will continue to work with India on strategic stability, confidence building, and nuclear risk reduction. The global security architecture is evidently in a flux. We need to forge a new security consensus to deal with interrelated issues of disarmament, <coughs> non-proliferation, vertical nuclear proliferation, accumulation of advanced conventional and non-strategic weapons, and development and deployment of ABM systems. We propose the following steps, we meaning Pakistan. Uh, convening of a special UN conference to build new consensus on disarmament. Two, a comprehensive program of disarmament under international control within a specific time period, um, which and it should be anchored in the principles of verification and irreversibility. It should include development of confidence building measures and public support. Three, concerted efforts to remove the drivers of conflict and steer regions towards strategic restraint and responsibility. Maintenance of nuclear weapons on de-alert status. Creation of a global regime on missiles. No operational deployment of nuclear ballistic missiles. No acquisition or production or deployment of anti-ballistic missile systems. Global Zero recaptures majority of international communities aspiration to move towards gradual elimination of all nuclear weapons. An elaborate institutional framework has been created to achieve this objective. For years there was no political will to pursue this goal because of real politique. Now we see a political surge behind disarmament. 
it would be prudent to make optimal use of the existing multinational, multilateral disarmament machinery to achieve this objective. Finally, Global Zero should not be misconstrued as a signal to jettison civilian uses of nuclear energy. There are many energy deficit countries, including Pakistan, which are using nuclear power as part of its energy mix to generate electricity for consumers and industry. I thank you. Thank you very much for that good overview. Let's turn now to uh, Andrew Pierre. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm delighted to be here at this uh, wonderful conference with so many uh, interesting participants. I thank the Hazan Institute for everything. Uh, I'm going to quickly add that I regret being here because I'm uh, on short notice uh, filling the slot uh, of Edward Ift, who in fact is listed on your program, who suffered a uh, loss in his family and uh, was unable to come. And I'd like to thank uh, Bruce McDonald and uh, Paul Hughes and John Park on my left. They are the mainstays of uh, USIP's work on problems of arms control and disarmament and much more. And I'm just a mere passing fellow on a short trip at USIP. Now, we do meet at a time of uh, renewed interest in arms control and disarmament, and not just because of the situation in North Korea and in Iran. Uh, we have achieved a certain point in the arms control process with a uh, new start in which we have to sort of think through where we go now. And uh, this means that we need to uh, deal with uh, some, some difficult issues in the arms control field. Uh, and I'm going to focus on two of them. Uh, one is theater missile defense uh, in Europe. Uh, and how do, we, how do we fit that into the next round of uh, arms control negotiations? And then, as Bruce uh, mentioned in his opening remarks, I am going to talk about really a new subject, which is multilateral strategic arms control involving countries other than, or in addition to, I should say, uh, the United States and Russia. And then time permitting, I'll spend about half a minute on a surprise third topic. So <laughs> stick around. Um, now, let me turn right away to uh, missile defense. Uh, it has become, in recent months in particular, absolutely central to the arms control dialogue between uh, Russia uh, and the United States and more broadly Russia and, uh, and NATO. The new elements are that more than ever, the United States and really our European allies as well want to find a way to counter what we perceive to be the growing missile threat from Iran. Uh, we are taking it uh, very, very seriously. Uh, and that means that we want to have uh, in dealing with the Iranian missile threat, we want to think about seriously some type of a cover uh, for Europe uh, as a whole. Um, what the Obama administration did in really not rejecting the Bush plan, but in revising it, was to strengthen it and widen it to give, we hope, relatively effective missile defense uh, for Europe uh, as a whole so that the phased uh, adaptive approach, as it is called now, um, initially calls for SM-3 uh, missiles as interceptors, but then phased into successive or successor uh, missile systems so that by uh, 2020, uh, it is the intention of the administration and I think the Europeans as well to have 440, up to 440 interceptors uh, placed in Romania and in Poland and, uh, and included on 43 uh, ships, mainly in the Mediterranean. Now, the Russians uh, are, are, are very uncomfortable with this, to put it mildly. 
I think it's fair to say that ever since uh, Star Wars, the Strategic Defense Initiative of 25 years ago, uh, the Russians have been concerned about strategic missile defense for the overall um, security of their country. And in some ways, theater missile defense uh, looks uh, similar to them, not in this technology, but in the risks that, and threats that it, uh, it uh, places on Russia itself. Um, the Russian concerns today are principally that any new system deployed in Europe uh, should not uh, undermine their own security. Uh, and they do state that they fear that missile defense will eventually be developed to the point where it could counter uh, Russian uh, ICBMs. Uh, I think uh, with all the explanations that have been made to them at NATO and elsewhere, they do understand now that uh, the initial phase uh, with the SM-3 is not in any way a threat to Russian missile capabilities. But they remain, and say so quite openly, very concerned about the later phases of um, phased, um, <coughs> the phased adaptive approach. So I would characterize the Russian uh, concern as deep and in some ways quite uh, understandable, and not just a negotiating ploy to uh, eradicate the possibility of a NATO slash U.S. Uh, missile system. Uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, has stated that he would like to see a written guarantee, not quite a treaty, but a written guarantee that um, any missiles developed by the United States and our European allies uh, will not threaten Russia. Um, there are today ongoing Russian-American discussions towards some type of a cooperative missile system, but they have not yet achieved fruition because there are somewhat different points of view. Um, the United States favors somehow bringing together the Russian system of interception uh, with a separate U.S. NATO system, basically we would call it a, a, an Atlantic Alliance of systems. Um, the Russians, on the other hand, want to integrate the NATO system with their own system. And that, for the moment at least, is a, is a more dramatic leap forward, let's say, than, than NATO governments are willing to undertake. Uh, on the other hand, there are other opportunities and one is to develop a method for sharing um, missile launch information, sharing between the United States, NATO, I should say, uh, and, the, and the Russians. Uh, there have been uh, suggestions made for a joint data uh, information center. Um, there are suggestions for collaboration. I mean, collaboration, I should say, is seen as uh, desirable by everybody who looks at this issue. But the United States is not, for the moment, uh, very keen on one single integrated system with the Russians. But it would like to um, work with them on our own system and their system. We, we, the United States, would be very happy to be able to receive Russian data um, from the radars which are targeted on northwest Iran and presumably the Russians would like to see whatever data we could provide them. Now why, why do I stress this and why is this issue so important? A deal involving uh, sharing of uh, missile defense information uh, would not be good only for missile defense in itself. But I believe that it would um, unlock the door of uh, dealing with tactical nuclear weapons, both uh, deployed and not deployed uh, on both sides, in, in Russia and, and, and in the NATO um, and the Atlantic Alliance. In other words, it could become part of whatever replaces some time down the road, the new start uh, I, don't know, I don't know if we're going to call it the new, new, new start or something of that sort. It will be the next phase uh, of, of, of the start process. There are many problems in, in this, and one in particular is the, the number of Rus Russian uh, 
tactical nuclear missiles, both deployed and undeployed. Uh, it's generally believed to be somewhere between uh, 4,000 and 6,000. Um, and the, on the western side, it is much, much smaller, probably closer to, to 1,000, perhaps even less. So an agreement on an overall ceiling on both sides um, is, is, is we're still a ways from that, but it's, it's what I think we should try to uh, head for. And it will require, as Corey pointed out, a very complex process of verification, inspection, uh, and the like. Um, we will need to overcome some differences and assumptions uh, regarding uh, missile defense. Um, the Russians uh, have long believed that they need large numbers of tactical nuclear weapons in order to counter what they perceive to be uh, NATO's conventional superiority. I must say that in lis listening to a reading about Secretary Gates in the last uh, few days and the speech that he made in Brussels, one wouldn't think that the United States had such massive superiority, or NATO had such massive superiority, but that's the way uh, the Russians uh, see it, nevertheless. Um, there is a question that it came up earlier this morning in one of the sessions about the extent to which uh, NATO needs tactical nuclear weapons. And in particular, of course, the forward deployed uh, American systems on, in some cases, on European aircraft, uh, and in particular in five countries. Um, I think Walt Slocum uh, at that session said it best that he should know when he said there was really no uh, military or strategic need uh, for this, these systems. These systems are an important part of psychological reassurance for some, some European publics, because not all believe that they are uh, necessary. NATO did make the decision at the Lisbon uh, summit to think of NATO as a nuclear power or with a nuclear component and any negotiation, I think the United States is now committed to the point that any negotiation with the Russians will have to be on behalf of NATO. So a consensus will have to develop in time uh, within NATO if we're going to have any serious reduction initially, or I should say on the one hand, by the, uh, the West, the United States and its European allies, and on the other hand, by the Soviet Union. So let me turn now to – Andrew, could I, just because we're, we're running a little behind time, can you wrap it up? I, uh, I will wrap this up, and I'll skip my surprise. Uh, let me say a word about multilateral uh, nuclear arms control, which is really something we're just barely beginning to think about. Basically, what are we talking about? Well, you know, you know which of the nuclear powers are. It doesn't seem to me that uh, Pakistan or India or Iran or even China are going to negotiate down their current levels of nuclear powers. So basically, you're talking about Britain and France. Um, the British have always had some interest in, in negotiate arms control. Um, they were, in fact, the first country, this is not widely known, to decide in 1940, before the United States, before the Manhattan Project, to build an atomic bomb. bomb. They've had a very robust nuclear program for decades, from the 50s into the 80s. Um, but in recent years, uh, they have reduced their program substantially, eliminated their tactical nuclear weapons on aircraft, reduced um, their uh, nuclear submarines have uh, been willing to rely upon American technology, Polaris and now uh, Trident. Um, they are, I believe, going to maintain a nuclear component indefinitely based solely on submarines, but I also think they are looking quite seriously at the possibility of s some further reductions if it, can be, if, if it can be done in some multilateral framework. Uh, there are four British horsemen to equivalent on the British side to the Schultz, et cetera, team. Um, and, and that's basically where they are. They're, they're interested in looking at this down the road, but quite a bit down the road. The French are in a very different uh, psychological and political position. Uh, nuclear weapons have always been played a central role uh, for the French. 
Uh, it's part of their popular way of looking at the world, of, of glory, of independence. Um, but it's interesting, and I might say in various governments, be it uh, Chirac and De Gaulle all the way through Carl Sarkozy, uh, Mitterrand, socialists, wanted to maintain the nuclear force. I'm going to assume that Dominique Strauss-Kahn uh, would have also, although we don't exactly know. But the difference with the French is that they do see a very uncertain world out there. They see their own nuclear weapons, independent nuclear weapons, as providing a sort of insurance policy for the French. They're thinking in particular, I might add, of Algeria and, and North Africa. Um, yet, and here's the interesting fact, the French, following a British proposal and American encouragement, um, have agreed to come to a meeting of all places in Paris later this year, which is involving the United States, I might add, with American support, looking at the possibility of multilateral arms control, even though French don't have that much to reduce. They are willing to do that. So we are now at a point where the, com the international community is beginning to think through uh, this uh, possibility. And uh, this probably will be added on to somehow or integrated into um, not, I believe, the next phase of start, perhaps the one after that. So we're looking at uh, 20... Uh, 10, maybe even more years uh, down the road. And of course, this will involve a great deal of transparency and verification. But I think the day will come when there will be multilateral arms control, even though it may be more symbolic than real in terms of the actual weapons systems deployed. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Now we'll turn to um, uh, John Park. Maybe you can particularly can uh, shed some uh, some light on uh, uh, impact and uh, of these considerations vis-a-vis uh, -vis Northeast Asia. Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, I'd like to echo my colleagues in thanking Asan for putting together a really remarkable uh, conference. Uh, let me just jump in right away. Uh, disarmament, uh, the way I interpret it for the points that I'll be raising, is really a concept. Uh, uh, had its origins in a bipolar world, but we're trying to apply it in a multipolar world, uh, basically what Andrew was uh, touching upon early. And some would argue in a G0, the absence of sustained global leadership, uh, what we did definitely see in, uh, in times past. My comments are, are really a, a collection of key findings from Track 1.5 and Track 2 dialogues that we run at the Institute. The great thing about having an institute with the, the term peace in it is that it's very innocuous sounding. And so people come to our dialogues with their guard down, very frank, and we're, we're able to get into uh, some very good discussions with current and former policymakers. Bruce's marching orders to me were to focus on three things. One is, uh, with, res with respect to disarmament, looking at managing uh, alliance dynamics. The second th thing is uh, what happens to deterrence. And the third is bringing other countries into the negotiations here. Now, with respect to the first part, uh, managing alliance dynamics, uh, what will be the impact of moving to a smaller and eventually zero uh, nuclear arsenal situation for South Korea? Uh, and I zero in on that for the interest of time, but also to spark some discussion later on. South Korea, and I think we can take a number of uh, uh, angles to this, uh, is unique to look at in terms of this because we see the impact of one and then uh, uh, two nuclear tests uh, from North Korea. The first nuclear test, October 2006, we see the United States Secretary of State at that time, Condoleezza Rice, come to Northeast Asia, go to Tokyo and Seoul, and reaffirm the U.S. nuclear umbrella. If you read that statement, it really looks like a statement from the Cold War period, because as much as North Korea had just conducted a nuclear uh, test at that particular point in time, uh, it really left uh, the larger concerns about uh, immediate threat perceptions coming from North Korea, uh, largely untested until we enter the second North Korean nuclear test. At that time, we are in a period right after President Obama's Prague speech and the pronouncement on Global Zero. Uh, but at the same time, we see the U.S. reaffirming, again, the pledge of the uh, nuclear umbrella. I think what we see now, though, is uh, an emerging gap between theory and reality. Uh, clearly, there is wide support for the concept of a world free of nuclear weapons, but when you unveil Global Zero in that type of situation, and we heard comments yesterday uh, by former Prime Minister Yi and former Minister uh, Han, 
the whole notion of frustration. We see this environment where there is the, the goal of uh, global zero, but the clear and present danger of a different type of uh, set of threats from North Korea. So moving to the second part, what happens to deterrence? Uh, really, this is a reality check. And, and 2010 is the clearest form of this reality check. In March of last year, we see the sinking of the Chonanam. In November, we see the shelling of South Korean island, Yeonpyeongdo, by North Korea. Now, this is, again, I think, a reminder of a clear and present danger emanating from North Korea. Uh, and this is evidenced by public opinion shifting in South Korea. Uh, during the uh, Sunshine Policy period, we see North Korea depicted as a weak state. If anything, the concern was North Korea collapsing and having to pick up the pieces. Uh, in the current situation, we see North Korea as bold and provocative. Uh, and again, as we heard yesterday in the opening ceremony, uh, the one factor that is cited is North Korea's view of itself as a nuclear weapon state. And who would dare retaliate against a nuclear weapon state uh, after having launched a conventional attack? But I think there's also a second factor, and this is China. Uh, it's interesting how I think if you look at the uh, North Korean response and what North Korea observed after the sinking of the Chunan, how uh, China uh, really lived up to what my colleague Mike Green calls uh, PRC, which is please remain calm, rather than being a, a very strong uh, a member of a group that is trying to condemn North Korean actions. You have China really trying to encourage the parties to restrain uh, their actions and, and engage in negotiations again. But this factor of, of China's response, I think, in, in some respect, fed into the shelling of Yeonpyeongdo in the sense that a recognition from a North Korean perspective that they would not see a deviation from PRC, please remain calm. And so the notion that they can kind of get away with it. Uh, and this is, again, feeding into this concept of a clear and present danger emanating from uh, North Korea. So look, looking at specifically what happens to deterrence, what are the uh, reactions? The first is South Korea's response. After the, uh, the reality check of 2010, we see uh, South Korea enunciate what is now called proactive deterrence. Uh, it looks very much like controlled escalation. But if you talk to military professionals, there is no such thing as controlled escalation. Once reaction feeds into reaction, you're essentially caught up in the spiral and you're left uh, to pick up the pieces. Uh, and in the situation uh, of the reality checks of 2010, uh, we see this reaffirmation on the U.S. side, again, of the nuclear umbrella. So I think what we're observing, and this isn't critical of any country's policy, but is an increasing disconnect uh, between uh, concept and reality. Uh, the weak points of uh, proactive deterrence, as laid out by some colleagues in Washington, is that uh, proactive deterrence implicitly depends on third parties to come in and control the escalation in the case that a South Korean response triggers a DPRK counter response. In this instance, the third parties are really China and Russia. Uh, if you go back to what Mike Green said, PRC standing for please remain calm, uh, how can we see a robust uh, uh, reaction and, and ability to uh, control this type of uh, escalation. And all of this is another consequence. I think we see uh, an exacerbation of the sense of frustration in South Korea and a lot of talk about the reintroduction of tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, moving to the, the third and last part here, uh, bringing other countries into negotiations, I uh, wanted to take a slightly different angle and, and shift to India and Pakistan. Uh, in one of the tractor dialogues I participated with uh, former senior military officials from both sides, uh, the image that comes up is uh, unanimous support for the concept and goal of global zero, but almost uh, an SAT type of situation. Disarmament is to major powers what philanthropy is to the wealthy. Uh, they feel that uh, global zero disarmament doesn't apply to them. It's a different context altogether. Uh, and in many respects, when you look at how uh, the Pakistanis and the Indians are looking at this, uh, there is almost this uh, uh, view that they're going to get to what they view as minimal uh, nuclear deterrent status. What that number is, unclear, but the notion that they'll know it when they reach it, and that from that point they may uh, draw down. So it's clearly a different direction arrow from the, the broader concept of global zero. And also we see the second phenomenon of not only India and Pakistan, but other countries, Iran and North Korea and this group, are going in, in another direction of actually expanding nuclear weapons uh, programs. And the final point in all this is uh, if we look at you know, almost this yin and yang relationship between disarmament and deterrence, uh, there will be a transition period uh, as we enter, hopefully, the different phases of disarmament. Uh, and as uh, different colleagues have mentioned, the focus on missile defense, number one. Uh, I, I would add, uh, number two, uh, measures like proliferation security initiative. Uh, the third is more sanctions. And the fourth is a focus on conventional. 
I, I would conclude by saying that if we look at all these different measures and approaches, uh, one gets the image of a medical analogy where uh, there are different medications for different types of issues. And here the elements are really uh, the different types of threats emanating from different regions in different countries. Uh, if you take the medical analogy further, uh, I think the concern here is the side effects when you combine the different medication. I think we're entering this phase because in dealing with one particular issue, as we've seen with the South Korean debate about the reintroduction tactical uh, nuclear weapons, it up opens up a host of other issues uh, that complicates uh, the situation. Let me end there. Thank you, John. Uh, I was going to start off with a question, but given that our time is slipping away from us, I think I'll just uh, open it up. Uh, do we have a, a question uh, from the audience for, for our panelists here? Yeah, over there. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, I am from India. Uh, my question is uh, for, uh, for, for John Park. He was talking about uh, the India's and Pakistani role in disarmament in South in their own regions. So, if you look at uh, the disarmament. Uh, scenario uh, all over the world. And you've got um, in Pacific, South Pacific nuclear free zones existing. It's at work now. It is maintained. The Americans, uh, to some extent, they are cooperating. And then uh, in the Middle East, the initiatives there for, for nuclear weapon free zones. Middle East nuclear weapon free zones. But in the case of uh, South Asia uh, nuclear weapon free zones, uh, India and Pakistan since they have become nuclear open powers, whether the Americans agree or not, that is a different question anyway, but they have become nuclear open powers. They have got um, 50 to 60 bombs, according to uh, maybe CIA report. So that way, the existing uh, weapon systems prevents both countries not to involve in nuclear open free zone in South, uh, South Asia. So South um, nuclear open free zone co as a concept is... Uh, is there a question coming up? Uh? Yeah, the, uh, uh, the, that, that way, you, what do you think about this uh, kind of uh, uh, nuclear open free zone concept, whether it has to uh, you know, uh, be forwarded or uh, it has to be put down? So uh, it's a very important question, and I think it goes into, uh, again, what my, uh, one of my colleagues mentioned earlier about uh, mutually assured stability. Uh, I think for uh, topics like nuclear weapons, free zones, and other areas, uh, you need a tremendous amount of mutually assured stability. But that costs money, and that costs a lot of money. Uh, so my concern, and this is, I think, uh, feeding into a new reality that we're already experiencing in Washington, is a budget-constrained environment that is going to last for quite a while uh, in the United States. So this goes back to the concept of global zero. Uh, I don't think we're there yet, but uh, it's hard to see sustained leadership uh, as we've seen in the past. And this is a concern that I have as the gap increases between concept and reality uh, in the case of South uh, Asia, as I participated in this track too, uh, it was a really good opportunity to take fresh stock of local arguments uh, internally in India and Pakistan as well as between the two countries. And the picture, the regional picture that emerges, one is that as China modernizes and incrementally increases their nuclear arsenal, uh, India feels a gap and, and feels that they have to catch up to India. Pakistan sees a gap growing with India, so they feel they have to catch up. Uh, because of certain disadvantages, Pakistan is uh, seeking more nuclear cooperation with China. So this cycle and this spiral, uh, I, I think when it comes to the concept of nuclear weapons, uh, free zones, is very corrosive. It's not to say that it's impossible to move forward with these zones, but it's this reality. How do you deal with that corrosive element in the short term? Okay. Yeah, yeah back there. Thanks. Um, Henry Parham, I work for the in the Secretariat for the Elders, who've done some work to support Global uh, Zero Movement and uh, the ICNND and uh, the Schultz Nunn Initiative. Um, my question is um, the leadership that President Obama um, has shown on um, aiming for a world without nuclear weapons, is that still valid? Is it still effective? I mean, we've talked about the challenges um, to go to a world without zero, but I mean, without that high level leadership, we can't make any progress, and it seems like there's a bit of a downbeat <laughs> mood here about the prospects for uh, nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. So I'm just wondering 
what do we do, given we have seen action at the UN Security Council on the issue and with President Obama? If that's not good enough, then um, what's, the next, what's, the, what's the other option? Anybody want to take that? Corey? Sure, I'll, I'll maybe kick off with a comment, which is I think that presidential leadership is important in the United States. Uh, it's also important in Russia. It's important in all of the countries that possess nuclear weapons. But it has to be combined with making progress. Otherwise, we lose the momentum. And it doesn't mean progress towards disarmament per se. It's not about always striving towards reduced numbers, but it has to be about progress towards creating the conditions under which disarmament is a real, real possibility. And I think that's, you know, where the nuclear security project and its approach really come at this question and, and where when you talk to Schultz, Perry, Nunn, or Kissinger, they talk about resolving regional conflict as a precondition. It, not as a precondition, as, a, as an element without which you're not going to make real progress. They talk about getting a handle on the, um, the fuel cycle. Um, and that, in my mind, includes um, talking about how fuel cycle uh, activities are pursued in the states that already have it. It's not just talking about the, you know, the states that want new fuel cycle facilities, because then we're getting into haves and have-nots, and that's not a fair conversation either. It, it's relevant to uh, nonproliferation because we do know that if we're not making progress on nonproliferation, there's going to be a greater hesitance to make progress on disarmament. So I think there are a number of issues that we have an opportunity to be sustaining and building the momentum that will, uh, through their progress, create um, the light at the end of the tunnel. And the concern that I've had is that people looked at the Prague speech and saw this grand vision. I mean, it's a very inspiring speech when you actually watch it delivered. Um, but it has fallen in some communities in the realm of the idealistic, and in the realm of the impossible. And, without, and so we have to take these steps in order to show that it's not impossible, but it takes hard work and it takes commitment and it takes sacrifice on all sides, from the non-nuclear weapon states, the nuclear weapon states, and the non-NPT states. Anyone else? Uh, yeah. Ambassador Khan. Well, I would say that uh, President Obama's uh, leadership is still valid and effective. There are some caveats and qualifications. I would like to add that uh, uh, powerful voices, influential voices within the U.S. administration should not second-guess what, what President Obama has said. Uh, second, there should be continuity. The establishment should be behind him. The second administration, the next administration, should not undermine his vision. And uh, I would also like to add that uh, what he said speaks to the consensus which is already there because, I mean, the vast majority of non-nuclear weapon states have said that they do not want nuclear weapons at all, that eliminate them gradually. And there has been some movement in that regard in the past. I mean, there, there are structures available there. There is no need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, but to use, make optimum use of the existing machinery that we have. And we can reach there. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we, let's uh, quickly take uh, any remaining questions uh, here at this table. Uh. I'm Scott Davis with the State Department. <clears throat> My question is for Andrew Pierre. Um, I was a little surprised when you talked about multilateral arms control. You sort of gave China a pass. You talked about the entry into the discussions of the U.K. and France. And we all know why China has been reluctant, um, particularly the, the argument they make about how few nuclear weapons they have compared to the U.S. and Russia. But did you really mean to give them a pass from that? Um, you kind of left them out of your formula. And, and if so, uh, why? And if not, uh, when you talked about the multilateral uh, arms control prospects, yeah. you talked about uh, U.K. and France getting involved, but not China. And I wondered how you would comment on uh, when, how, and, and uh under what circumstances China should get involved. Okay, uh, now we'll take the uh, one other question here, and then because we're, we're rapidly running out of time. If we can. Uh, Masaoto is Kyoto News. And my question would be uh, crossing over the uh, gentleman's question right now regarding uh, China. Uh, it's a very uh, persuasive presentation by Corey. It's a very, you know, it's a great presentation of the uh, robust inspection regime in the future. But I would like to know uh, your approach to uh, China, how you can engage China or other countries, especially French, 
to involved in the uh, disqualification, you know, uh, establishment measure in the future? What's your approach and outreach to a ch uh, country outside our, you know, current negotiation, Russia and the United States? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Panelists? Well, um, I look forward to a panel, I think, coming up. I hope it's to take place this morning on China and this nuclear program. Um, to get, you know, some insight. I, I think you've asked a very, very important question. Um, but uh, I also think that uh, just establishing the principle of multilateral arms control, which we don't have yet, if we can begin with the British and French, or they can begin with us, because it's their proposal more than ours at this point. There's a senior White House official at this conference, uh, you may know. I did ask him uh, publicly yesterday uh, whether, in fact, this meeting is going to take place in France and so on. The answer was yes. So the, it's, the process, even if it's only a discussion stage, is beginning. I think it might be asking too much to ask of the Chinese to come in at this time. And I don't know that they've gone far enough in their own nuclear program to reach the level of maturity, both in terms of technology and perhaps in terms of political outlook, to participate in multilateral arms control negotiations. But down the road, um, theoretically, there's no, no reason why it could not take place. But I'd like to go back to a point which I think Bruce made uh, in, in his opening remark, at least he's made to me at other times, this all depends on the political environment, the international political environment. Uh, for anything, for you know, the next phases of arms control, in particular, bringing in other countries. So, to the extent that there is a rivalry, perhaps a growing rivalry of some sort or another between um, the United States and, and, and China or Europe and China, that has to be overcome before you before the Chinese have a self-confidence and perhaps even an inducement to participate in their own, to, in multilateral arms control. Okay. okay. I'll answer Masa's question quickly with, with two answers. One is, which builds on the last one, I think it's really important that we involve the non-NPT states and all of the P5, so India, Israel, Pakistan, and the P5, in the verification discussions at the beginning because you can't develop a system and then ask other countries to accept it. It has to be developed with all these countries' concerns in mind, and that is why we're, we think that there's a value to a, a broad international verification discussion that includes non-nuclear weapon states as well before we get to the point of actually negotiating a system, but rather developing measures and approaches that can be implemented with the current situation, in civilian activities, I think we need to talk more seriously about introducing international safeguards in all states with nuclear weapons and not just the non-nuclear weapon states. So there are ways to bring them in from the beginning so it's not an imposed system. And I would say the same thing with arms control. Arms control is a process, and it's a process that other than the U.S. and Russia, other countries have not had transparency into and have not been a part of. And I think if we want to make progress on multilateral disarmament, we need to start bringing them into the process, even if it's just at a discussion phase and not a negotiation phase. Okay. With that, uh, I want to uh, just make a couple of announcements. First, I want to add my voice to express my thanks to the Assan Institute for making this panel and indeed all the panels and the, uh, the entire uh, plenum uh, po possible and um, uh, the opportunity that it's given us here today. Uh, secondly, they have asked me to make uh, an announcement, which I will do. <clears throat> uh, after this session, there will be a closed networking lunch at designated restaurants around Seoul. For those who have already registered, the buses will be waiting outside the first floor lobby entrance. Please get on the bus with a letter that matches the one on the back of your conference ID badge. If you don't have one, you should, like I neglected to get one, uh, go down to the registration desk. The staff will be outside to assist you with the process. So with that, please join me in thanking our panel for a great discussion we've had today.